Welcome everybody to Monday Night Live. My name's Derek Arden and tonight we've got the one and only Justin Urquhart Stewart with us. As you know, Justin is a uh, always on television, on the radio, BBC commentator on all sorts of financial issues. So uh, once again, we're delighted, Justin, that you've been able to support us and support Monday Night Live. Welcome. Thank you, Derek. That's a great pleasure. A privilege to be asked. Compared with some of the television uh, interviews you have to do, I have to say it's great having an audience like this that actually understands a lot of what's going on. When you have to go onto some of the, the, the uh, um, channels, particularly for some reason the Russian television stations want to interview you. Um, I'm sure they're up, up to something unpleasant, but anyway. Justin, OK, well, it's a, it's a while since we've had you on. It's the 1st of March since you were last with us. So uh, what's been going on in the economic and the financial world apart from... Uh, some awful things um, like uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and trading. Tell us all about it. Well, it's been, let's just, I suppose, just start with crypto for a second because it does grab the headlines on a regular basis. Uh, and it goes from uh, utter horror for everybody to suddenly uh, um, greed and why didn't I join in with this as well? Now, let's be clear now, cryptocurrencies are not currencies. Now, it is a mechanism, an asset of um, some vague value, which can be highly erratic. We even had El Salvador this year, that well-known uh, international powerhouse of a nation, trying to actually transfer and utilize uh, Bitcoin as their natural currency, um, which given that their natural currency is a colon, I think is rather worrying actually. Um, but uh, they were put down by the MF and said, no, stick to your body parts and stay with the colon. Um, and uh, so it is really very strange indeed. What is more interesting though, is how now that some of the central banks are realizing, it's not so much that um, they should be supporting Bitcoin and things like that, although I find it I'm frankly very annoying when I see some of the trading houses opening up more trading ability in them. And frankly, it's encouraging a black art. Um, but actually, central banks, they're looking at having their own form of cryptocurrency, crypto debt, by which they affect me. Remember, all the uh, crypto structures are based on blockchain. And blockchain, simply put, is basically like a spider's web. Um, any part of that, you touch any part of that web, the rest of the web knows about it immediately, um, particularly the spider. Um, and so therefore, if you were running a currency which was operated like that, you would know who had that currency or that particular asset at any one time. So if you were, say, controlling your money and not wishing it to get into the darker areas of money launderers and such like, it would be a rather good way of trying to do it. So you'd end up with a much more secure form of currency or tradable debt or something like that. So certainly the Bank of England has been looking at this uh, really very uh, seriously indeed um, as a better way of probably trying to control uh, our currency overall. Does that mean you ditch sterling and we suddenly go to a, a sterling crypto? No, that's highly unlikely. But in terms of the increased uh, uh, impact that technology is having on financial security, uh, this is an area which is going to develop further but not with the likes of Bitcoin and things like that. It's the structure underneath it. It's going to be much more important. So leave that to one side. What's happened since the 1st of March? And the answer is, well, good news. The global economy has done quite well. Uh, deeply unexciting to say that. You're supposed to say doom and gloom and disaster. Global, the global economy is going to be growing at about five, maybe five and a half percent this year. It's an extremely vague figure because no one can calculate it precisely. Most of that's going to be coming out of China, not surprisingly, um, because they were the first one in and the first one out. Um, and remember, before the pandemic, we were heading for an economic slowdown anyway. You know, we tend to have blamed everything on the pandemic, uh, but uh, we were under economic pressure. It's just that we seem to have forgotten about that. Now, the growth of recovery has been so strong that actually we've had um, uh, Bloomberg Television as ever, you know, giving people you know, frightening days. Um, and if you are a, a nervous investor, don't watch Bloomberg Television because uh, every slightest movement will be a headline. Um, what you really want to be able to see is where the trends going. And the trends are that actually now, I think the biggest story over the past three months is the impact, the potential impact of inflation. And so is inflation back? And the answer is yes, it is. Are we going to go back to the inflation at some of us of a certain age, like well, maybe Derek, he just about qualifies at that age, uh, certainly me, go back to the days of double digit uh, 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 inflation. We've got up to one stage just under 25% inflation in the UK uh, in the 70s. We were almost becoming Brazilian. Um, and uh, so uh, that luckily that didn't last for too long, but it really was quite horrific. Whereas now, of course, we've had a generation and a half who have no experience of inflation at all. And what damage it can do 
to assets. Um, and uh, in terms of people say on sort of fixed, um, uh, fixed income assets and things like that, a lot of people were devastated during the 70s. Um, a lot of people who held those fixed bonds and such like and uh, were finding it really very difficult indeed. So we don't want to have inflation back again. But on the other hand, you also like to have some inflation. Uh, you want to be a bit like Goldilocks, neither too hot nor too cold. The trouble with the gold lake story is you've got stocking rate bear then turns up at the end of it, which you really don't want to have. Um, but the issue is this. Uh, if we're going to see some inflation coming through, and we can see it certainly in the United Kingdom. Um, we can see it in America in terms of basic uh, asset shortages, pushing up prices. Um, we're even having cement bags being stolen in London, uh, which is quite astonishing. But shortage of steel, all those sort of things. But also, now that we are able to go back to the pubs and restaurants, I'm sure most of us have noticed that the service may be terribly polite, but somewhat slow. That's because they can't get the people to work. Uh, why? No, no surprises. They've got home. Got home being over the channel. So we have a uh, no, huge shortage there. What do you have to do? We've got to pay more. Well, that's probably actually quite a good thing. But of course, if they pay more, we pay more. And of course, that ends up being inflationary. So do we have that inflationary spiral that we could see in the 70s? And the answer is not yet. Um, however, with labor shortages, with constriction on uh, supplies of commodities, um, then you have the certainly the basis there of certainly higher levels of inflation. Therefore, to make this very extremely long-winded point, central banks have been looking at raising interest rates. Now, before we all panic, that does not mean rates are going up this year, maybe not next year. But they're talking about two years ahead. The fact that they're talking in that sort of term gives you some idea, at least we are getting some uh, better forward vision as to what's happening. Of course, they don't actually know what's happening in two years' time. They're just merely speculating on that basis. So we need to be prepared, therefore, to make sure that portfolios do have some inflation protection in that. It doesn't mean necessarily inflation bonds, but it means also those companies which will still benefit from rising prices. Um, and uh, so that's certainly going to, be, uh, going to be the case. So we'll need to take an account of that. So rising inflation expectations and rising growth actually is good news compared to, again, where we were this time last year, which was looking pretty dire. Um, the question is, well, we have the V-shaped recovery, and we're all used to that. The question is, what happens after the V? Does it carry on after that? Um, has it got enough strength to carry on with? Um, and if so, what sort of uh, stimulation does it have to have? Where do you get the stimulation from? Cutting interest rates? Mm, quite difficult when they're ignored. Um, borrowing more money? We've already done quite a lot of that. So we need to think very carefully, therefore, where does the next growth stage come from? And at the moment, the market's having trouble trying to do that. Better news is the UK markets have been looking a bit uh, healthier as those rather boring companies that no one wanted to really be dealt with, deal with last year. Um, you know, the old companies, the banks and all those sort of things, um, a lot of the value stocks they called coming back now so that actually getting a bit more attention. And so they see the UK market picking up a bit. But remember, the UK stock market is not the UK economy. It's an international market. I'm extremely concerned, actually, about parts of the FTSE 100, as we now have two pizza delivery firms uh, there as participants in the FTSE 100, and therefore a good chance they're in your pension scheme. So when you've got Deliveroo or Take That or Throw It Away or whatever you like to call it um, in there, frankly, these aren't you know, high-tech businesses, which is how they've been highlighted. That pizza delivery companies, or rather cold pizza and Indian delivery companies. There was a terrible accident in of Green the other day with three of the Lambrettas actually hitting each other. And the worst thing was actually the mixture of food was absolutely disgusting <laughs> over the road. It was there for some time. Um, I think the drivers were fine. Uh, so actually things have been picking up. Geopolitically, we need to be aware of certain things. I know we've had a lot of fuss over uh, the G7. And the G7, remember, is the wealthiest nations by, by per head, which therefore excludes China and India, um, uh, which is a bit uh, strange because you really are ignoring the dragon and the elephant in the room. Um, but so it's much more important that actually those G7 meetings actually broaden out to the G20. Russia, economically, remember, is irrelevant. The Russian economy is worth 40% of the entire UK economy. Russia is dangerous. It's a dangerous uh, power, but it's not a superpower. Um, so if we fret over the price of the cost of a missile, uh, they should be fretting because they've got the money to do so. Well, remember that population is shrinking, no, numbers are falling off a cliff, some are probably being pushed off a cliff, wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Um, and uh, they're now offering free uh, Soviet, sorry, 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 free Russian citizenship to any of the Kazakhs that haven't been wandering around. I'm not too sure I'd find that wonderfully uh, exciting myself, but maybe life will get desperate one day, I have to do that. 
The other area which I think is more important actually, of course, is China. And China, as we've just had President Xi celebrating 100 years uh, history of the Communist Party. Um, and uh, so all very powerful stuff. And of course, making usual sort of saber rattling noises about the power. And remember, they still go on about 100 years of humiliation from our days of the opium wars, where the UK led the world in being the world's largest drug trader. We made, frankly, Colombia look like an amateur, um, actually fighting two wars to make sure the Chinese got more opium. Um, but leaving that aside, and of course, uh, the other European nations and Oriental nations and Americans all getting involved in China with their little um, uh, equivalents of Hong Kong, it was their century of humiliation as far as they could see it, with everybody having taken their peace out of China. And so as far as they're concerned, it's well, not quite payback time, but certainly the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the sabers are rattling in their, um, uh, in their, in their hands. Uh, do watch out over the next few weeks, because that's part of that same fleet that went past, and it wasn't just our boat. I did love the way the BBC implied that it was just uh, our own boat that went past Crimea the other day. Um, it was actually a whole lot of NATO ships going through. It's just the photographs was just slightly selective. Well, most of that fleet is now going to turn up, um, uh, along with, of course, uh, one of our new uh, carriers. Um, our carriers, of course, don't actually seem to have any planes on them as yet, but that's merely that's just, you know, just a detail. Um, but uh, to really force the issue over Taiwan, or more to the point, bring it to the fore, and the Chinese are now getting very, very sensitive over Taiwan, uh, and also the South China Sea, and also the East China Sea, where they're having a bicker with the Japanese, or continuing the same bicker. So that's going to be more tension. But remember the background to this, the Chinese are nothing if not pragmatic. And you don't deal with the Chinese, like with, with Mr. Trump, by shouting at them. Um, you deal with the Chinese um, in private with a consenting adult. Um, and uh, that's how you get deals done. The Chinese need the Americans. Uh, why? Because that's their biggest customer. The Americans need the Chinese. Why? Because most of the time, they're their biggest owner of the debt. Um, so they are in a symbiotic relationship. I know a phrase I've used before, but nonetheless true. That, I think, is still encouraging because it's a great disincentive from people actually going to war um, over trade issues and things like that. You know how easily these things can slip out of control. Um, Biden seems to be a pragmatist. Um, uh, Xi is mercurial, but uh, is also pragmatic as well. It's not his, in his interest to have the country get poorer. The Communist Party maintain control because of uh, their, uh, uh, their overall power there, but they are very concerned about the social unrest and concerns, I don't mean the Uyghurs or Tibetans, uh, but domestic unrest um, in, the, uh, in the eastern cities, particularly from those workers coming in from the countryside. Um, so they are always very concerned about just how strong is their power base, particularly as the country becomes, has a greater and larger and more powerful middle class who tend to get a more, bit fussier over things and won't necessarily do as they're told as per the, the previous generation. So I think overall, we're in a not bad position. The issue for UK, some of those Brexit issues are coming home to roost at the moment in terms of trade elements and things like that. But also, isn't it interesting to see actually how the EU are cocking themselves up in a fairly significant way? One of the problems is they don't have any major leadership. We have uh, Mrs. Merkel, yeah, Angela, disappearing quite soon. Um, and name one other German leader. And, uh, I think we uh, shouldn't enter that competition. Uh, li live, living German leader probably is probably the better way to put it. The answer is we really don't know many. Uh, and frankly, nor do many of the Germans. There's no natural leader there coming out. And Europe needs some leadership. Um, and if you don't get that leadership, you're going to get that more coming out of Brussels. And Brussels becoming is increasingly unpopular. Uh, and remember that old line coming out of the, uh, of the combination of groups, what they call the um, Zagreb, not Zagreb group. I've forgotten, it's the group of the East European um, members of the EU. And uh, they basically said, look, we didn't swap 20 years of being run by Moscow for another 20 years of being run by, by Brussels. We demand, we have power brought back to us locally. And does that sound vaguely familiar to us in our discussions? Well, maybe not, um, but it is fascinating. So they have, are gonna be having some significant problems there. Remember that same issue with the EU overall is the Euro. The euro is still a fundamentally weak currency because unless you control it as a single currency with a harmonized fiscal structure, monetary structure, free movement of capital, um, and uh, con uh, properly controlled regulatory structure over the whole thing, it's not going to work very well. Um, and so it can exist for the time being. But unless they address those things, then it may, be it may take 10 years. 
but it'll have to change uh, or it'll find itself splitting into two, which wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. It doesn't mean that we're wonderful by leaving and uh, you know, we're saying, haven't we done well? Look what's happened with Nissan. Well, Nissan didn't necessarily say that they were going to uh, have an electric base here beforehand. Nissan was still just like Toyota and Honda. They saw Britain as a gateway to Europe, not as a destination. However, with a nice bit of uh, incentive money from the government, albeit not being properly declared as yet, this, uh, this uh, battery plant uh, in Sunderland will be of uh, great strength and looks like we're going to have a second one being developed uh, as well in the Midlands. Um, and also Ellesmere Port looks like it's going to be saved with a similar issue um, uh, where the Astra, currently owned by uh, uh, Citroen Peugeot, or actually a subsidiary of that group, um, and we'll be getting a, another, another uh, investment. One element I think was interesting about Nissan, though, wasn't really picked up by much of the media, was that remember you had the old Nissan Renault linkage together uh, with their boss, who had to find himself under house arrest in Japan and then had to escape in a box um, out. So there's now Mr. Gone has gone and then popped up again in Lebanon. And uh, he was the one that put uh, Renault and Nissan together. Uh, in many ways, actually, to try and help this sound significant, and he did, but the Japanese don't take well to uh, Johnny Foreigner coming in trying to run things. Um, and so you saw a split here. So it was interesting to see that Nissan's decision to build this huge uh, battery plant in uh, Sunderland, when in the same group in Renault, an identical plant is being built at Douai in, uh, in France. And so it just shows actually how these companies are pulling apart. Um, and so this could be an interesting issue for us to see that those that don't want to be seen be, be in Europe necessarily may see Britain as the alternative. A bit of a thin story so far, but an interesting one to see how that corporate has changed quite so radically. So those are my, some of my key elements at the moment. I'm probably, I know I've missed out on all sorts of issues, but do pick me up on uh, elements that I can uh, uh, try and answer. Well, we'll come back to those um, later, Justin, because we're nearly out of time on this particular interview before we move on. Um, it's pretty positive news, is it? Or are we getting carried away with the um, with the football and uh, Nissan and the politics and the jabs? It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, said, the jabs have put us in a position where uh, we are ahead of the game on this. Now, I said, where are we now? Just after five o'clock. So Boris has had his uh, speech and no doubt been telling us that uh, it's all going to get better because he doesn't like giving speeches that don't include those words. Um, and so it, it, in theory, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to be released because so many have had our double jabs. Um, and uh, so that, that is an encouraging sign. Interesting, see at the weekend, a combination of Formula One, not as important as before, um, Raga, Lions, not as important as before, um, uh, obviously Wimbledon, uh, and of course, uh, the football. How much that added to the British economy well, we're probably looking at about a figure of over 250 million pounds for a weekend dominated by sport. Even if we didn't get much sunshine, uh, everyone went out and they actually did have a decent drink and the rest of them found themselves wrapped up with a lambretta and a, a lemon, what's left of a pizza. Um, and uh, so, yes, that is a positive sign indeed. And our growth figures are actually looking really rather good. But we have a problem. The problem is our businesses, and we have a lot of good growth businesses, they have a huge shortage of where they get capital from. So what we're seeing now, and you saw it at the weekend again, um, Morrison's, another um, British company, as we've seen as various others over the past few years, being attacked by private equity companies, which aren't all bad. Mm, you know, not all of that. Uh, black knights and white knights just seem to be more black knights around at the moment. Um, and uh, so they see these businesses as being pretty cheap internationally cash generating dull businesses which they can pick up at what they see as a discount. Do they let them grow and enjoy that benefit or do they split them apart and uh, manage the resources, also known as asset strip? Um, um, so it depends your view on private equity. So uh, actually that's I think has been a significant change as companies now looking to try and grow, where do they get capital from? And if they can't grow, they'll get bought up by somebody else and quite often from another country. Justin, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for supporting Monday Night Live. I really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a few months time. Um, and um, we'll be back talking about regionally very shortly.